Welcome to session three of day two of Rhythm Interventions Online. I'm Richard Schilling speaking to you from Welbeck Health Centre in London. And we've got a really intriguing set of sessions in store for the next hour and a 20, focusing on occlusion of the left atrial appendage. And as we've promised, we're gonna bring you the latest technologies showing you how they work and what the future might hold for electrophysiology. So our next presentation is left atrial appendage ex exclusion using a revolutionary rotational LAA closure device. But first I'd like to introduce you to our panel. We've got Rio course co-directors, Jason Andrade from Vic, uh, Vancouver and Debbie Nair from Arkansas. And we're also joined by Luigi DiBiazzi, who's actually in Rio at the moment, I believe. Welcome to all three of you. Oh. Thank you very much, Richard. So, Thank you, everybody, for having me. So for this session, Debbie has pre-recorded a case at her centre in St. Bernard's Heart and Vascular Centre in Janesborough, Arkansas. And remember, please keep submitting questions for the panel. Before we start, let's just have a quick poll and we'll ask you, the res we'll look at the results at some point during the presentation. So what would you consider as the main Achilles heel for left atrial appendage occlusion and closure? Is it para-device leaks? Is it device-related thrombus? Is it post-thrombotic regime? Um, interestingly, you've got different questions <laughs> from the ones up here, but... Anyway, answer those questions and vote now and we'll look at those results shortly. Um, so, Debbie, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I am gonna start playing. All right, so um, I'm gonna show a case that we recently recorded uh, using a novel uh, technology called the Laminar System or the LAX LA Exclusion System, which uses uh, rotational uh, LA closure. Let me advance to the next slide here. Could you help me advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is an animation of how the system works. It has a, a ball that uh, rotates the uh, left atrial appendage, uh, closes uh, closed shut. And once the ball rotates the left atrial appendage, uh, out, it gets locked in place uh, with this uh, uh, little locking device uh, that has a very small um, uh, footprint. And the idea is the LA uh, or the LA endo endothelializes over this uh, system. So uh, a very neat animation uh, from that standpoint. Um, I will need help advancing that if, uh, if you can. To the next slide, please. So this is kind of the, uh, the system in place. You can see on the upper left corner, um, you can see the ball um, and it comes with the, the lock in place. Uh, it's a preloaded system. Um, you can see there's a stabilizer that kind of holds everything in place um, and a, a sheet that has a guide steering, so it's deflectible. Um, and then the preloaded device has a certain knobs. You can see there's a white knob that is to unsheath the ball um, there is a black knob that helps you rotate uh, the device. Um, and it, you can see it's very methodical. You can see those uh, little numbers on there. That is, a, It's a very methodical and very calculated closure. And then the, the white knob all the way at the back that deploys uh, the implant as such. Um, from a sizing standpoint, uh, you have uh, two devices currently available. Um, there are mo mo other sizes that are uh, currently being uh, uh, um, developed and uh, evaluated. But uh, in the early feasibility work, we looked at the 12 millimeter implant and a 16 millimeter device. And it, it spans for these two sizes, it can cover anywhere from 11 millimeter osteum, which we're looking at mean uh, average uh, osteal dimensions of about 11 all the way up to about 27. Um, regarding what's exposed on the left atrial side, once we're done, um, I'm comparing the laminar, which is on the side, the lock of the laminar system to the Watchman Flex, a 20 millimeter device, and the smallest amulet, which is a 16 millimeter, uh, and the disc shown. And you can see um, how the images are scaled one to one, and you can see how small the footprint is on the left atrial uh, side. 
So um, let me uh, give you a history on our patient that we uh, performed this uh, procedure. It's a 71-year-old male who had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, had PVI, um, has had CAD, he's had a stroke before, has had heart failure, hypertension, he's got renal dysfunction. Um, he was uh, referred for appendage closure for recurrent GI bleeds requiring uh, multiple transfusions, currently on uh, Plavix for his uh, CAD and Eliquis uh, for anticoagulation for stroke prevention and obviously me has has very high chance of a score and a, and a has split score. And here I've uh, created an, a, a 3D segmentation using the FIOPS model, which is an automated uh, 3D segmentation software that allows us to uh, replicate what that anatomy of that appendage looks. It's a complex left atrial appendage uh, with uh, multiple proximal lobes um, and uh, distal um, uh, trabeculations. So um, this is the first clip here showing some uh, pre-implant imaging. Um, you can see uh, this is uh, zero degrees. We kind of uh, measure the appendage in uh, different angles. Uh, this is the three dimension of it. And you can clearly see how oval uh, that appendage is um, in, in its three dimension. Um, it measures anywhere uh, about 18 uh, to 26 uh, millimeters. So really oval appendage uh, that uh, can sometimes be uh, challenging. Here we are getting ready for vascular access. You can see I always get access with ultrasound guidance, um, especially in these patients. I mean, that's one of the things I try to avoid having any kind of uh, vascular uh, uh, problems. And you can see I, I, I did a pre-closure with per close. Um, and we're trying to do transeptal here with the, the VersaCross system. You can see the little pigtail wire that just went into the SVC. We're coming down with the VersaCross sheet here. And this is done under TE guidance uh, currently. And you can see I'm in a biplane view, uh, looking at uh, the, the bi bicaval view and the short axis view, trying to get across in the inferior mid position uh, with that appendage. So you can see that I cross with the versa cross loop there. This is an RF delivery at the tip that allows us to uh, cross in a very uh, systematic fashion. And once I'm across, I'll take that uh, versa cross sheath uh, across into the left atrium. We'll measure a quick LA pressure. Um, and I don't routinely use a pigtail in the left atrial appendage. I use that versa cross loop pigtail wire into the appendage. And you can clearly see the LA angiogram simulating what that 3D looked like with multiple proximal lobes. That loop is about 24 millimeters. And I think we're catching the appendage in its widest ostium there, uh, where we measured on the CT at 26. So um, kind of uh, uh, stays there with, uh, with the sizing. So Richard, I, I'm just wondering if uh, we can take a pause and uh, maybe have a discussion on uh, what uh, would be the considerations for uh, devices at this point before I move on and show the actual implant. Um, so I think currently, uh, um, uh, uh, if, if we want to bring the panelists back um, and, and see what, uh, what they would uh, uh, consider this as, you know, with the imaging and uh, what their thoughts are about the appendage that we are dealing with today. Yeah, well, let me let me start with Jason, and and then we'll go to Luigi. Jason, looking at the anatomy of this, what's your feelings about your strategy if you were going to close this appendage? Yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest thing is you know how much of a landing zone do you have with the proximal lobes, and are you going to lead to leaks? I mean, the CT looked like it had quite a wide sort of funnel of a neck based on the reconstruction that I saw. So, I mean that looks like there should be somewhere where you should be able to get a good grip but the worry would be i think that your device would deploy a bit distal rather than where you'd want it to start you'd end up with a little bit of a pouch at the proximal end and luigi what's your preferred device choice well, in this situation i mean uh, actually my question for dave is that you you're going to try this device that you show in the video but do you think that this technology that you are going to show is affected by the type of appendage you have. I have the impression that it's not. Uh, I mean, this type of appendage probably can be closed with any type of device, uh, but is the one you are showing affected by the morphology or it's more neutral about that? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Luigi. I think uh, I think the beauty is that we, you know, we want to try to get to a technology maybe that uh, that is free of uh, bias from what, what morphology we're dealing with. Uh, and you're right. I think uh, what, what I would like to show is 
uh, at the how the technology really does not, uh, 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 you know, really interact with what the morphology of that appendage is. And it can be any morphology and uh, you are trying to get that uh, adequate implant or adequate closure or exclusion in this matter uh, with, um, with the system, no matter what is lying distal to your um, rotation zone is how I'd say. I think you still need some depth. You can see that ball is about, you know, 12 millimeter. So you do need that 12 millimeter depth to be in there and, and, and grab the tissue. But you can definitely see, like Jason said, there's a lot of proximal pectinates and it's very funneled in. Um, so uh, the, I think the current occlusive devices, especially the devices being round, um, and, and we're trying to close a very oval appendage, you either almost have to either have an overcompressed device to, to get that. And so uh, I think those are challenges that we face uh, currently. Um, and Richard, if it's okay, I'll, I'll move on to the, the actual implant video, if that's okay. All right. Okay. Let's uh, play that. So here we are uh, getting ready for sheath exchange. And as I said, it's an 18 French uh, sheath. You can see on the, on, the, on the video there, I have a little orange uh, kind of desk to maintain the stabilizer. Um, going under fluoro, slowly taking that sheath across. It's a very smooth sheath with a great transition. Uh, here, Michael's bringing in the stabilizer for me. Um, and the stabilizer kind of locks that sheath in place. Um, you know, as an EP, I'm not used to stabilizers, and uh, I think this comes from the MitraClip world, but it's really fascinating to have something that just holds everything and you have, you're kind of hands-free. And uh, here I'm bringing that preloaded delivery system in, um, and you can see as, as we are coming uh, in, we'll lock it in place, and then we'll lock it onto the stabilizer, um, and it holds everything in place at that point, and I'm almost hands-free after that point, and it's all minute deflections at this point. So we're well, watching in 3D on that, uh, on that TEE, you can see my sheath position. Um, I'm trying to stay somewhere in the mid atrium and we are gonna start unsheathing and you'll see me rotate the ball, uh, the, white, uh, the white knob that exposes the ball. And um, you'll see it on the TEE 3D imaging as well as on fluoroscopy as I slowly unsheath, um, as I rotate that little white knob, it exposes the ball and then we're going to expose the the the, uh, the hub of that ball and give it a little more uh, reach. And uh, you'll see me kind of push pull back on the on the sheath, uh, giving the ball room to open up within the left atrial chamber. Um, and and the entire procedure kind of gets done in in 3D uh, because we're trying to orient all of this in 3D. And on the bottom of the 3D, you have the biplane 45 135 view uh, that I'm showing as well. Uh, the mitral valve on the left side in that current image. Um, and you can see we're using the de little deflection on the sheath, uh, slightly deflecting it down, orienting it more towards the, the left atrial appendage there. Uh, very small, uh, slow, deliberate uh, movements here uh, as we move the device into the uh, left atrial appendage or orient the device into the left atrial appendage. Um, again, at this point, before we enter the appendage, um, I, I like to uh, make sure that I'm in plane and in line. Um, so I'll get my uh, imaging folks to um, kind of get re reassess everything, uh, get everything in plane uh, before um, we kind of get back in there. And you can see I'm headed towards the appendage there, um, um, uh, trying to get my, uh, you know, get, in, get my bases there. You can see my uh, Adam, who's my images, uh, getting my T lined up, getting my 3D in there. Uh, our TEs are done by our CRNAs who do a phenomenal job of uh, getting us good images. And uh, here he's getting a 3D in plane before I move in. Um, and you can see my valve on the bottom on that 3D. You can see I'm going directly into the appendage there. Um, the ball is uh, soft, but it still has little um, barbs. So we're very careful as we enter the appendage um, um, with the ball. And I will confirm uh, that I'm in the appendage uh, with an angiogram shot after I get in. And again, um, you'll see we're getting an angio. I'm in the mid chamber of the, uh, the left atrial appendage there. Uh, I'll confirm that on the uh, uh, 3D as well. Make sure I'm in good orientation. You can see on on the 2D biplane on the 
on the uh, TEE that I'm in the left atrium, uh, left atrial appendage there. And at this point, I'm gaining a uh, contact. So I'm moving it towards the back of that appendage, trying to get contact. You can see I'm in more of a, uh, a one o'clock position there. I, uh, I, I kind of went in a more counterclock. Uh, you can see I'm rotating the entire system and moving it slowly, making sure the ball touches the back end of the uh, appendage uh, and, and just need bare contact to make sure that uh, as I start rotating, um, I, can, um, I can grab the tissue. So at this point, you'll see me turn that black knob to a counterclockwise. So counterclockwise rotate, rotating the appendage here. And if you watch on 3D, you'll see that the appendage uh, kind of starts, the, the, starts getting uh, uh, obliterated. And uh, we'll do about, um, in this case, we did about, uh, I would say about 180 degree turn and um, uh, the, it's all measured and marked. So it's, it's small turns. Uh, we're rotating it very uh, slowly. Again, very slow, deliberate motion. Right there on that TE, you can see how we are, the appendage seems to be obliterated there. So before I make any more rotations, I'll do an angio to make sure I actually grabbed everything I need. And um, this was a case where actually when we look at it, it doesn't look like we actually got the anterior pectinate and the anterior lobes were not coming in as well. So at this point, I'm loosening it and then uh, clocking the system and opening the appendage back up. So uh, if if I did not rotate the way I wanted to, which I obviously didn't in this case, I'm opening the appendage back up and you can see on the 3D uh, TE there, the appendage is now back open. Uh, I just unrotated it, clockwise rotated it and, and opened the appendage back up. And then um, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just kind of reorienting my, uh, my, um, a laminar ball in maybe more of a two o'clock angle, just kind of going a little more posterior than where I was before to maybe grab more of that tissue as I rotated. It almost is like you're rotating a, a bread bag and rotating it shut. Um, so you can see I'm now starting to rotate again. Um, my uh, right hand is on that black knob and I'm slowly turning. And, and what I'm watching is that 3D TEE and uh, I'm looking for the obliteration on 3DT, there it is. We just see it again, how the appendage is now closed shut again. And before we rotate anymore, I'll, I'll lock it in place and I'm hands off, I'm injecting. And you can see now I have grabbed the entire appendage. Um, we, have, we, have not locked, we have not completely occluded it or excluded it. You can see a little bit of contrast going through the center, but I've all actually gained the entire volume of the appendage in that rotation. So at this point we will pull back the system. Um, in this case, we pull back about a centimeter and the, on the stabilizer, there's actual measurements. So you, you, it's again, calibrated pulling back. We pull back, we rotate further. You can see I'm rotating with my right hand on that black knob, which is a rotation handle. And uh, I've completed my full 360 degree rotation there. Um, and you can see how the, the appendage is completely eliminated uh, at this point uh, with the with rotation. And um, we'll confirm that we have completely uh, um, uh, rotated it, it in place. Uh, we'll check on, on TEE. We will check on angiogram. Uh, we'll make sure that we have not rotated too much, uh, especially on, the, on that uh, 3D TEE to make sure that the atrial wall is still intact. You can see we're checking in uh, 2D angles as well as 3D angles to make sure that we have not left any proximal trabeculae behind. We have not pulled on the left atrium. We have not pulled on the neighboring structures or the pulmonary vein. Um, and then when we when we are comfortable with the, the actual rotation, then uh, we are ready to bring the lock into place. So that is more unsheathing. So I'm now using the, the first unsheathed white knob. I'm unsheathing the lock and you'll see the lock just popped in place on fluoroscopy. You can also see that on, on TE, but really well seen on uh, fluoroscopy there. And once that lock is, uh, is exposed, uh, we'll slowly move the lock uh, kind of forward. So we're, we're kind of engaging the lock or locking the system them together at this point. So the ball and the lock kind of come close together. You'll see, if you watch that little uh, shaft within the ball, you'll see how they're coming closer and closer as I'm moving the system uh, together and uh, they get locked in place. And uh, we'll, we again do it, uh, we watch the ball, we make sure the ball's not getting distorted. Um, we're coming close and here we have completely locked it into place 
Uh, so the ball and the lock are now one system in, 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 in place. And once we are there, we'll do another angiogram uh, to make sure everything is good. And you can clearly see how well the appendage is eliminated. You actually can see the contrast still within the appendage that was there from previous injections that has not been able to come out. Um, and that's something we've seen. We'll actually see that contrast disappear the next day when we do fluoroscopy images. So here, we're getting re ready to release. Uh, that little white knob at the back was the release and uh, you almost kind of release and kind of push it forward. So once it's released, uh, I'm, you can see I'm just kind of, it's almost like you have it together and you're just kind of letting it go. Um, and it, it pops out of, uh, in, into the, you just saw that device just kind of release uh, on me. And we'll pull the sheet back. Um, we'll do a final, at this point, I guess there's no going back, but we've already checked that we have adequate exclusion of the appendage, uh, but we'll pull back um, and we'll do a final angiogram here. Um, and we'll do final assessments on our TEE, both 2D imaging and 3D imaging uh, to make sure that we have uh, good occlusion and exclusion actually uh, in this matter. And here uh, we do the final angiogram here. Um, you can see how well that appendage is fully eliminated uh, with uh, no contrast uh, as uh, going into the appendage with a complete exclusion of that uh, left atrial appendage. Um, and I think it's uh, more fascinating to see some of the uh, the 3D images um, uh, when we see them uh, for follow-up as well. And you can see we're starting to bring some of that 3D images uh, up. Um, you can see the footprint of what's left on the left atrial side is very, very small. Um, uh, Let's see, uh, and I think, and, and that's, I think, one of the things, and in 3D, we also assess uh, the, the, the neighboring structures, the pulmonary vein, uh, and these are things that we have assessed in the, as we did some of the early feasibility work. This is at 45 uh, day imaging. You can see uh, it's almost near endothelialization. You don't really see that lock uh, as well anymore. Um, and this was actually 45 day CT that was actually part of the protocol. And on the left, I'm showing you the appendage uh, before and after, um, and you can see, you just see the device with uh, complete exclusion um, of the uh, left atrial appendage um, uh, in this patient. Um, so Richard, I think um, um, I'll, I'll pause here uh, before I kind of show another anatomy uh, and, and take any questions um, from you and the panel. Well, uh, I mean, it's an incredibly fascinating technology and a, a really interesting case. Um, Presumably the risks of this particular device are tearing and tamponade rather than embolization or failure of occlusion. Is that is that fair? Um, I, I would say in, in if you if you were to ask me in, in the order of what I'm worried about most, I would say yes, uh, LA uh, tear would be uh, the first thing that we, we watch out for. Um, obviously, if you don't occlude uh, or exclude adequately, you can have leaks. Um, and you saw in the beginning as I'm rotating, I'm being extremely cautious that I'm actually excluding the appendage completely um, and making sure that I don't leave any uh, lobes behind because that is really the only way you could you could have leaks. Um, Device-related thrombus really is not an issue, I would think, with this with such a small footprint. Um, but I'll I'll definitely share some of the data from the early feasibility work uh, that was actually just presented at TCT and show you what was seen through the multiple centers for sure. Later in the uh, later in the presentation. So let me let me um, first start by asking Luigi, whose video is not on, but he, I know he's with us. Um, Luigi, you you've demonstrated in studies that the appendage can be a really important source, not of M not just of stroke, but also of AF. And um, presumably, would, would, would this be a sort of device that you'd use in everyone to eliminate both the uh, anatomy and the electrophysiology of the appendage? Well, uh... I think it needs to be demonstrated if you can do, you know, an electric isolation with this device, but it's intriguing. The question I have for David, what's the inflammation? Do you have pericarditis in these patients? It's a, it's a great question. We actually, in the early feasibility study, we actually pre-treated uh, patients with colchicine, um, low-dose colchicine uh, at 0.3 uh, uh, milligram dose, um, about a couple of days, two, three days before, and for about um, a few days after. Uh, we do see a slight troponin uh, rise um, as well. And um, 
Uh, I mean, I'm sure that if they uh, are not on something, they could potentially develop some pericarditis or atrial um, pericarditis for sure. But we haven't seen any uh, pericardial effusions or anything like that from the pericarditis, um, mostly just uh, chest pressure and pain, uh, which goes away as long as the patient's on some colchicine or some tortol, for that matter. And, and let me ask Jason, um, in terms of demand for this type of device, I mean, certainly in the UK, Dorax have made them much less attractive for some patients because they're so easy to take. What, what's the experience in Canada? Is that uh, are these very popular technologies to use to help stroke prevention? Uh, I, I would say that probably Canada is a little bit closer to the UK and general utilization versus kind of what we see uh, south of us in the United States. I mean, we do at our center and we're considered, you know, a reasonably high volume center. We do like 60 a year. So you're not talking about a ton of left atrial appendage occlusion devices or exclusion devices, generally speaking. And I think that that's probably partly the funding model, but probably uh, other factors that come along with it. I mean, we we have a relatively broad program in terms of the devices we use. I haven't seen this one before, which is why I have a, a whole host of questions for Debbie. Um, but, you know, in general, it's something that's there in the background. We have uh, a multidisciplinary team that approves all implants, but it's not got the widespread use that you see in other jurisdictions, let's say. Um, so I'm inherently lazy. So why don't you ask your questions to Debbie? And that saves me a job. Sure. So uh, I guess the you, you sort of answered a bit of it at the beginning when you were responding to Luigi. I, you know, when I look at all of the different morphologies of left atrial appendages, I mean, the ideal would be to have one device that fits all. Um, this one seems to have nuance to it that's different from, you know, what we'd consider to be a plug of the ostium. And I, I guess the question is, how much of an impact does let's just say osteal geometry, so ovality versus circularness, and then say a landing zone. So when you are actually rotating the appendage that you have enough, uh, as you said, twist in the bread bag to occlude it versus something that, you know, has got maybe a short diameter, like a chicken wing appendix where your, your rotation is gonna be on a stump rather than a long neck. Um, you know, so how do those factors go into the decision around choosing this device over something else? And do you need much of a landing zone for that rotational aspect before you get the plug in? So it's a uh, it's a great question. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a great segue to my next video. Um, so I, I, I probably, uh, I might do that video and then answer that question and I'll definitely take that question. But I, uh, before we get into the, the next video, I will say that you do need uh, a depth because you have to get that ball into the appendage. So, and and the smallest ball right now is 12, and um, the, we, uh, there there is uh, work in progress to look at a 10 millimeter ball as well, which means you would need a 10 millimeter depth minimal. Um, the 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 average ostium right now is about 11 that that this could go in as long as you can get your way into it um you can and i'll show some um some anatomies uh, different anatomies that we occluded as well so let me actually move into my next presentation and um, um and that might help answer some of the questions too jason so um let me advance this. Um, so here, uh, this is actually a, another case, and um, uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but you can see on that uh, right top chamber view is a, is a chicken wing anatomy there. Um, and you can see the ostium, it doesn't really, on a 3D, doesn't really show that uh, chicken wing uh, anatomy. Uh, it's nice and round. Um, this is a, a glass view. Uh, this is our, uh, our CRNAs and our echographers just showing off their skill sets here, but a really nice, nice round appendage, which is a nice treat when you look at it. And then you look at this appendage that is round, but really does not have a lot of uh, uh, depth and a, a great chicken wing uh, anatomy here, um, uh, shown again with the angiogram. And you can uh, you can see I'm coming in with the, with the ball here, uh, advancing, you can see I'm uh, on fluoro, I'm, I've gone into the appendage there and I've kind of rotated it shut. Um, and you can see it on 3D as well as on the angiogram, how the uh, uh, appendage is now completely uh, rotated and excluded. As long as I have 
uh, enough uh, depth uh, to uh, in enter with the ball. Um, you can clearly see on the glass view here as well how that appendage just kind of closes shut. And, it, and the 3D to me is extremely valuable to make sure that uh, number one, you're, uh, you've uh, excluded the appendage completely. Number two, you're not uh, taking any of the left atrial tissue and twisting it as well. Um, so here you can see on the 3D that we're very even on our left atrial side. You can see on the angiogram that we have uh, almost complete exclusion of that chicken wing morphology there. Um, and uh, this is that final angiogram in that case. And again, showing... Uh, uh, complete exclusion of that chicken wing anatomy. So really it doesn't matter what's distal, you're pretty much just rotating it shut at the ostium. Um, uh, and so um, hopefully that kind of answers a little bit of uh, what Jason was asking about the type of uh, morphology of the appendage. Uh, the depth currently does matter uh, with, the, with, the, with the ball uh, uh, and the ball being able to be accommodated in the appendage. But beyond that, uh, I would say that the morphology is not as big of an issue. This is a 45-day imaging on that patient. Again, uh, it, it, to me, what stands out is the very small footprint uh, that I see uh, with the uh, with this device. Um, and I want to just show, um, you know, we were able to uh, do about 11 uh, cases uh, for, as part of the early feasibility study uh, that we were part of. And these are the 11 different anatomies. And I, I did a, this is a 3D segmentation of all those 11 different anatomies uh, that we did. And you can see they're very variable, very different, um, different morphologies, different, uh, obviously different dimensions. Uh, we did have a screening criteria and uh, screening CTs prior to enrollment in the EFS mainly because there were only two sizes that were used in the EFS, which was the 12 and the 16. So we had to eliminate uh, some of those uh, really small and the really large appendages, which potentially could could and uh, will probably get excluded in the future with the, with the newer sizes that are uh, being developed. And then uh, as the, just a word on the early feasibility trial, um, it was uh, sent, done in seven centers with eight operators. So just kind of looking at, uh, you know, when the first look at this, uh, you know, when I saw the system about four years ago, uh, I, you know, I, I was like, no way am I rotating the appendage uh, like that. And, and so they wanted to um, kind of make sure that there was, uh, there was experience between EPs as well as ICs. Um, and and uh, at least in the early feasibility work, different operators doing the study. You can see 45 subjects were enrolled um, in seven uh, U.S. clinical sites. Uh, three of the patients were actually converted to Watchman Flex, mainly because of the depth issue uh, that we uh, we uh, uh, and uh, we learned we were learning in the early feasibility work as well that uh, there are certain anatomies and certain type of depths that we actually have to have for the ball to go in. 42 subjects that actually had the laminar device implanted and had TE at 45 days and uh, will have a clinical follow-up uh, at, at 12 months. And you can see the, the results of the early feasibility trial were presented at TCT. Uh, very st uh, strong safety results from the early experience. Again, it's a very small experience, but this is the early feasibility work. No death, no stroke, no major bleeding. Obviously, these patients went home on DAPT for 45 days um, and were switched over to aspirin at 45 days after they got their imaging. There were two pericardial effusions. So, Richard, coming back to your uh, question on what is the first thing that we worry about uh, with this uh, closure is is obviously LA tear. And both of these cases in the early feasibility work, they did um, uh, they did see the uh, effusion as they were rotating and uh, continued to just rotate it shut. Uh, obviously very skilled uh, operators that uh, were just able to exclude the appendage at that point and uh, the patients actually did very well and were discharged home the next day. So not that, uh, not the, uh, the worrisome tear that uh, that that could have led to surgical uh, closure or anything uh, anyway. So uh, we did see two effusions uh, in the uh, early feasibility work. Uh, the primary efficacy showed a very high rate of closure. And uh, what stood out the most was that there was no device-related thrombus with this uh, short imaging. Now, again, we don't have the uh, long-term follow-up yet. We're, we are waiting on those results. Uh, but um, the pivotal trial is uh, gonna uh, is approved and will start enrollment uh, pretty soon in um, hopefully um, December or maybe January of 2024. Um, we probably will see our first pivotal trial, and that means more sites, uh, more global.
uh, when we look at that. So um, I, I'll actually uh, stop here and, and, and take any uh, for the questions. And I'm curious to see what the poll results are uh, from the yeah. poll that you actually asked. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. So let's, I think they have got the correct question. So let's see what the poll results were. Um, noting that your this strategy was 45 days of aspirin or antiplatelets. Um, so, okay, so it's an even split between peri-device leaks and device-related thrombus, um, and the post-thrombotic regime doesn't seem to cause as many people concern. Um, presumably on this device, your uh, post-procedure uh, thrombos thrombotic um, strategy is much less because the footprint and exposure in the circulation is much less. Is that fair? Uh, that's that's exactly right. So, um, the, I mean, the footprint uh, that's uh, of the device that's exposed to the pandi or the left atrial side is so small, and and I tried to put that comparison because that's kind of easier to kind of think about. Um, and and uh, the fact that you know, I mean, it's hard to assess endothelialization. Uh, but when we look at the TEs at 45 days and look at the 3D, it's really sometimes very hard to actually see the the lock um, because when we're hoping it's because of the endothelialization. Let me ask um, Luigi to either make a final comment or a question, then I'll ask Jason to do the same. So I think it, I think it may be stunned silence from Luigi. So Jason, have you got any um, questions or thoughts about final thoughts about this? Uh, lots. I have a question that I don't know you know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and it may be stupid. But um, given the mechanism of how you're excluding the appendage, right? You're creating traction and rotational energy at the ostium, and then you're putting on the plug. Have they looked at any impact on collateral structures that lie in that region? So <clears throat> have they seen anything with phrenic nerve? Have they seen anything with theoretically uh, circumflex? But I'm guessing the circumflex is probably m further away than the appendage. So so uh, great question. Um, so I'll, I'll say that um, oh, the circumflex has been assessed. So um, Sabu Kar, who was a na national PF for the EFS study, actually did... Um, uh, angiograms um, in his first uh, 15 or so cases, in every case, pre and post, and uh, really showed that the, the circumflex does not get affected in any way, um, uh, mainly because we were seeing some troponin rises. So we, you know, I think it was the right thing to do. I did not do any angiograms. Um, I, I tried to stay off of the, the coronary circulation, but he had already demonstrated it by that time. Um, we haven't seen any, um, we do do x-rays, um, after, and we do do x-rays the next day, uh, and at 45 days, we bring them back and actually do fluoroscopy and assess the device under fluoroscopy with spontaneous uh, respiration. So we have not seen any phrenic nerve, at least in my center. Um, uh, we, we did not actually present that data specifically at the uh, at TCT uh, for the EFS trial, but um, I can tell you for all the 11 patients, uh, I, you know, there, there were no issues that I saw in my site with any uh, diaphragm movement. Um, the pulmonary vein is the other structure, which I think we assess at the time of uh, implant. And we're also having, we have CTs at 45 days um, and the TE at 45 days that has not really shown any difference in pulmonary vein velocities uh, or any dimensional changes in the pulmonary veins. Um, so those are really uh, the main things and no additional uh, no significant changes with the mitral valve either uh, with any additional regurgitation or anything like that that we saw in our 45-day uh, imaging as well. Does that answer the question in any way? Of course. It's a very good answer. Well, thanks, Debbie. Um, we're coming towards the end. I think it's fascinating that even in the patients who clearly had an acute bleed because it happened during the procedure that the it didn't progress. So presumably the appendage was just being closed off and any tear in it was was limited. Um, we're now at the end of the session. Um, I'm really grateful to Devi and her team in Arkansas for a fantastic case and to our expert panel for the uh, insights they gave us, Jason and Luigi. And they'll be joining us again in the next session, I hope. There's still plenty to come on day two of Rio, so stay tuned and we'll be back in just a moment.